Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? I'm ready for the event. Gail Borden Public Library, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Carol Metal here with students at Gail Borden Public Library. How do you hear me? Carol and everybody there, I hear you loud and clear. Good to talk to you today. I'm ready for your questions. <laughs> Good morning, Jeff Williams. We have many questions to ask, and we are excited to be asking them of an astronaut who has so much experience in the International Space Station. And even though we are Bears fans, and I'm assuming that you, uh, coming from Wisconsin, uh, root for the arch rival Green Bay Packers, <laughs> we still have a lot of energy in this room. Right, kids? <laughs> and I just want to add that uh, Wisconsin being America's dairy land, that uh, our library was named after the inventor of condensed milk, Gail Borden, who had many dairy farms in Elgin. Libraries are huge supporters of technology education. We present and we sponsor many technology events as well as teaching classes in technology. We know that your father, Jeff, was a teacher and I'm sure that your family knew the power that libraries can bring. In this library alone, our many resources include over 2,500 space-related materials and so much uh, information for uh, everyone to learn about space and, and uh, astronomy and all. We are so very proud to host this very special and unique event and now for the questions. Hello, this is Donovan. After all of your training, what surprised you the most about being on the International Space Station? That's a good question. I don't know if I've had any real big surprises. Maybe that's the biggest surprise I have, have had is that uh, there are a few surprises up here. We trained for years, as you probably know. Uh, we trained in not only in Houston, but also in Russia and Japan and Germany and Canada for, to cover all the systems and all the operations that we do. And the training is very good and effective. So thankfully, even though we've had some unexpected things occur up here, they've been things that we have trained for and prepared for, thankfully. Hi, this is Nayali. What do you miss the most about Earth when you are in what when you are in flight? That's a very good question. Obviously, the thing I miss the most is my family, uh, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, my daughters-in-law. I miss them uh, being up here. It's a, you're here a long time, and you're here for, or you're in Russia for a couple of months before the launch, and then you launch you up here for six months uh, before you return to Earth. So that's what I miss the most. But aside from that, I also miss things like uh, quiet, um, the the sound of just a breeze blowing through uh, through the fields, so the smell of grass and flowers and trees, and all of that. This is a very uh, sanitary environment up here. We don't get those smells of nature. Um, and we've got continuous noise up here uh, from fans and pumps running in the background. So those are the things that I miss the most. Hi, this is Danny. Do you ever see a shooting star fly, fly past the space station? I ever, I'm sorry, I missed that. Do I ever see shooting stars? Is that what you said? Yes. As a matter of fact, you know to see a shooting star, you see it when a meteor hits the atmosphere, and then we call it a meteorite. And we see it because of the friction and the heat that it builds up because it's going so fast through the atmosphere. We're above the atmosphere up here. So to see meteorites, 
and I have seen a couple on occasion when I've been in the window looking out uh, at an uh, uh, Earth nighttime, orbital nighttime, when it's night where we're flying over. I've seen them, but they've been below us, which is very strange as they pass through the atmosphere. But I have seen them on occasion. Hello, this is Jillian. What experiments are you working on in space that will help people on Earth? Well, I hope that most of the experiments that we have up here will help in some way, either directly or indirect, directly the people on Earth. And we do a wide variety of experiments, as, as you probably know, doing your research uh, into the program. Uh, we do experiments across the different spectrum of science disciplines. One of the most interesting things that we do, areas that we study, are the human body and the effects of weightlessness on the human body. We've got studies going on to study changes in vision in space. We've got studies going on to, to, uh, to look at the changes in bone density, uh, in cardiovascular uh, changes in the body. All of those things have direct applicability to health um, and, and for everybody uh, in understanding uh, how we can better uh, treat uh, uh, diseases or other ailments that we occur, injuries, uh, that kind of thing on Earth. So I trust everything will benefit directly or indirectly uh, the people on Earth. Hi, this is Sarah. Here's a question from the African American Research Library and Cultural Center of Broward County in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Pearl would like to know, what does it feel like the moment you take off in a rocket? You know that something significant just happened in your life when the rocket lifts off from the launch pad. It's almost getting fired, like imagine getting fired on a slingshot or whatnot. Although it starts out kind of slow, there's a lot of rumbling, and when you first lift off the launch pad, uh, it seems like you're moving very slow, but the acceleration um, builds up very, very quickly, and it only takes a few seconds before you realize that you are moving out and you're moving out fast. And after a few minutes, of course, you get the sensation of speed as you see the Earth going by. And then you see that the sky turn from a, a blue, the blue sky that we see when we get above the weather, if we're going through weather, and the blue turns to black, even though it's daytime and the sun is shining and it, you know you're entering space. So those are just a, a several of the elements uh, that you uh, observe and, and take note of when you are launching on a rocket. Hi, this is Carter. Has the spaceship ever had any problems when you were aboard flying around the Earth? Occasionally we have problems. Uh, most of the problems that we have are relatively minor, but uh, during my time on board, we've, we've have had some major problems. We had problems of uh, a major power system problem that, that um, uh, took down our abilities to, to maintain the space station, to maintain the attitude of the space station for a long period of time, to maintain the power of all the systems uh, to, um, uh, to in, in a real long term, like days, it had a direct impact to the life support system. So those are our major problems. One's probably the worst, the most serious thing we, that we had while I've been on board was a fire in the Russian segment. Thankfully, we responded as we're trained, and we, um, we saved the situation fairly rapidly. It did cause some contamination in the, into the atmosphere, and we had to clean up the atmosphere. Uh, but thankfully, we were safe the entire time, and, and we resolved the problem. But those things do occur. We spent a lot of time training before the flight uh, to react to, to those kinds of problems uh, if they occur. Huh? Hi, this is Leilani. Will pets ever be allowed on the International Space Station? Was the question, could we have pets on the International Space Station? Yes, that's the question, Jeff. Uh, well, we have had uh, bugs and animals on board the International Space Station. I wouldn't call them pets, though. They're, usually they're part of an experiment, and it's kind of dangerous when you have something like that that's part of an experiment to make it a pet, because then that changes the whole relationship that you have with it. 
Um, so might there be pets in the future? I don't know. I don't know of any plans to really have any pets. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, resources uh, to keep uh, the air uh, healthy for food, for waste products, all of that. And having a pet on board just adds to that. So I, I don't see that happening in the life of the International Space Station. Hi, this is Bridget. How many astronauts are on the space station you, with you and from what countries? The International Space Station is very international. Uh, we typically have a crew of six on board. Currently, we have three of us on board. There are two Russians and me on board right now. Uh, we had three others just leave a little over a week ago, two, uh, an American, a Russian, and a British astronaut. We're, we are awaiting their replacements, which will uh, be a Japanese astronaut, an American astronaut, and another Russian cosmonaut. Uh, I've been on board with uh, Canadians, with Germans, with Belgians. Um, with, uh, there have been uh, French astronauts on board, and there have been uh, astronauts from many countries from the European Space Agency, from Japan, from Canada, from America, uh, and from Russia. So it is very international. Normally the crew uh, is made up of six. Currently we're going through about a three-week period of uh, three of us. Hi, this is Caden. Here's a question from a, from a Waukegan Public Library in Waukegan, Illinois. Elena would like to know, how did you become an astronaut? Well, the, the main way to become an astronaut is to apply for the job. That's, that's, for, that's true with any job. But the criteria and, and what makes you competitive is, is very um, unique, I would say. About, historically, about half the astronauts have been from military backgrounds, and I, like myself. Uh, most of us uh, are from um, aviation communities and the different branches of services. Most of us are experimental test pilots. Uh, so that's half, historically, half the, uh, the astronaut corps. The other half are made up of scientists and engineers and medical doctors and even a few school teachers, uh, historically. Uh, most of them have master's degrees or PhDs, uh, or as I said, medical doctors in different fields of science and engineering. Um, just about everybody has good, strong operational background, too. A lot of people have worked in extreme environments. Uh, or in environments that are very operationally oriented. A lot of people uh, among the civilian ranks also have aviation backgrounds, uh, are private pilots and, and the such. Um, uh, but just about everybody is in science, engineering, uh, technology of some type, or the medical field. Hi, this is Anya, and my question is, what do you eat in space? Our, our menu is uh, is varied, wide and varied. Um, of course, it's it's hard to have food up here that uh, it, we don't have a refrigerator. Well, we have a small one, but the food is not refrigerated in general, uh, so it has to have a shelf life that lasts a long time, months at a time. So we have a lot of food that's it's like military meals ready to eat. Uh, like this here is uh, chicken with corn and uh, baked beans, and you just heat it up and cut it open and eat it. Uh, we've got a lot of other food that is uh, dehydrated, uh, like right here is probably one of your favorite foods, asparagus. We have lots of vegetables like this dehydrated, and we stick a needle uh, in the end of this little bag and stick hot water in it. In 10 or 15 minutes, it's ready to eat. Cut it open with a pair of scissors and, uh, and dish it up with a, with a spoon. Uh, and we have lots of different kinds of, of foods. Uh, all of the, the entrees that you might think of, all of the vegetables that you might think of, the side dishes, desserts, and then, of course, we have drinks, uh, and the drinks come in bags like this where we stick a needle in, insert either uh, cool or hot water into it, depending upon what it is. This is a chocolate, chocolate breakfast drink uh, like you might have in your house. Uh, so that's one example. I typically drink coffee every morning, but through a straw. All our drinks are done through a straw. 
Uh, we also have a lot of international food. We've got a lot of Russian food on board. Uh, we sometimes have European food and Japanese food and even uh, Canadian. Uh, the Canadians contribute some unique food like smoked salmon. Hi, this is Virus. If you discovered a planet, what would you name it? That's a hard question. I don't know if I would ever want to name a planet myself. I have no idea what I would name a planet. I think that's such a significant thing to name a planet that it would have to be much, much bigger than me. We'd have to involve people around the world uh, and maybe maybe even uh, children around the world uh, have a contest to come up with a, um, a name and then have a selection committee to choose the winner. That's much bigger than me, though. Hi, this is Enzo. Would you want to go on a mission to Mars? That's a good question. Thankfully, I don't have to answer that question because I think Mars will be beyond my career. Uh, that's a completely different mission. You know, we leave Earth and we orbit the Earth, and we can look out the window from the space station. We can see the Earth all the time, day and night. We orbit the Earth 16 times a day, every 90 minutes. And Earth is our home, so there's a connection there. The trip to Mars will also last months, uh, so you're off the planet for months, but you're also out of the view, largely, of the planet. You can't even see stars out there because the sun is shining. We only see stars here when we are behind the shadow of the Earth and the sun isn't shining on us. If the sun is shining on us, we, it's so bright we can't see the stars. So that's a completely different uh, mission. So. Thankfully, I don't have to answer that question whether I would uh, go to Mars if asked to. Hi, this is Evan. I have a question from the Yuma County Library in Yuma, Arizona. Ben would like to know, is it fun to play with your food in space? <laughs> Every astronaut, no matter how old he or she is, turns into a kid again to play with the food. We play with the food all the time, and it's a lot of fun, and we don't have our mom and dad up here to tell us to stop playing with our food. Hi, this is Madison. Do you think there is life on another planet? That's a good question. I know that uh, is, question comes up all the time, and that's largely what's driving, or in part what's driving, I think, space exploration and the, the, the goal to get to Mars. Uh, personally, I, I don't see any evidence that there's life on other planets, uh, but it sure doesn't hurt to, to go look for it. And, uh, who, and even during, during the looking, who knows what we're going to discover. The history of human civilization is really the history of discovery and exploration. And if you study history, and my father was a history teacher, if you study history, you grow to appreciate how important discovery, exploration, trying to figure out what's around the corner, what's over the horizon, what's on the next planet is uh, to the future of civilization. Hold, stay right up here. I, I'm understanding that we are, that, that we are having to say goodbye, Jeff. Um, from Elgin, and we know what your words of wisdom have been, and, and it's about discovery, innovation, and expanding boundaries. And if you have done this today, 